Hi, I'm Hunter Lau from Effective Altruism Medicine. This group was created to spread EA ideas in healthcare, to provide networking opportunities, and to further the discussion on the role that medicine has in the EA movement. We're a relatively new group and would love to have you along for the ride. Hi, I'm Jack at One for the World. We ask people to pledge 1% of their income to the most cost-effective charities working in global health and poverty. So if you'd like to give just a small amount of your income to help some of the world's most disadvantaged people, please get in touch. We're also really keen to speak at universities and at workplaces about effective giving. So if your classmates or colleagues would like to join the fight against extreme poverty, please let me know. I'm Tanya Quijano, one of the co-organizers of Effective Altruism Philippines. Effective altruism groups are communities of people who learn together and support each other to effectively improve the lives of others. There are over 200 groups based in cities, countries, and universities all over the world, and there are even online groups that anyone can join wherever they live. Find your closest group on the EA Hub and reach out to the Center for Effective Altruism Groups team if you want to learn more. Hi, my name is Catherine McCrory Flynn, and I am the founder and director of Wambam. Uh, Wambam is a mentorship um, and professional network uh, that is designed for women, non binary people, and trans people of all genders. If you are interested and excited by effective altruism and looking to pursue a high impact career in this field, please reach out to me. Thank you. Giving what we can, are a community of effective givers. We aim to create a culture where people are inspired to give more and to give more effectively. Check out givingwhatwecan.org to find our effective giving recommendations, donate to a high impact charity, or to join our growing community of people who've pledged to give a meaningful portion of their income to help improve the lives of others. Catherine from the Centre for Effective Altruism. The Effective Altruism community is a group of people from all over the world that aim to use evidence and reason to work out how to benefit others as much as possible. The Centre for Effective Altruism supports this community. We run conferences, support local groups, and run the EA Forum, which is an online discussion space. We also support community members through our community health team. Please reach out if you'd like to know more. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those of you dining in uh, not from Australia. My name is Jack, as you just heard, I work for One for the World, an organization that asks people to pledge 1% of their income to the most cost-effective charities working in global health and poverty. So if that's something that interests you or you'd like other people around you to find out about that, then do please get in touch. A couple of housekeeping bits before we start. I'm very excited to have a fantastic panel of medics here and we are going to record today's webinar so that we can share it with people who weren't able to dial in live. If that makes you uncomfortable, please feel free to dial off and then to watch the recording afterwards. And I believe there's a live stream happening on Facebook as well where you could watch. But be reassured, you won't be featured, you can't be heard or seen unless you're one of the panellists. But I did want that um, to be clear before we started. Secondly, I have a few questions to get us started, but the purpose of today is for you to ask your questions of this fantastic panel. And it's going to go a lot better if they're answering your questions and not answering mine. So please start putting stuff in the Q&A and please make sure you use the question and answer function rather than the chat. So you'll see that at the bottom of your screen, there's a button for Q&A and you can upvote questions in there if you're interested in them as well. We can respond to them with writing if we don't have time to answer them verbally. And also we can tell you when we're going to answer your questions. So please take advantage of the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Why are we here? Well, we're all part of the effective altruism community. And probably the simplest definition of that is a group of people who are united by the common desire to use evidence and reason to try to figure out how we can best help other people and then take action based on those beliefs. And it's my privilege. Uh, I hope I won't be speaking very much today because although I have medical parents, I don't have any involvement in the medical community, but it's my privilege to introduce our panel. So first of all, we have Hunter Lau. Hunter is an American physician currently doing his specialization in emergency medicine in New York. He's a leader of the EA Medicine Group. He has taken the Giving What We Can pledge and he hopes to work in disaster emergency medicine preparedness and response. Hunter, really great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. 
Thanks, Jack. Thanks for the introduction. Glad to be here. I see climbing things behind your head. Are you going to start doing one finger pull ups to impress us during the uh, <laughs> during, <laughs> during the <laughs> webinar? Not quite. That is a climbing wall. It's a gift I got from my wife. She's more of a climber than I am, and I'm slowly getting into it. Okay, well, having watched Free Solo, I think uh, disaster emergency medicine preparedness and response may come in handy if she gets really into that, but we'll we'll leave that for a different webinar. Uh, my first question for you, obviously with your role at EA Medicine, you see a broad overview of the way that people try to be impactful within the field. So could you give us an overview of the different ways that you've seen and also highlight some of the non-medical doctor roles that have really stood out to you in your experience so far? A um, few things that stand out to me in my background, it's probably slightly um, uh, tilted towards people who are in the disaster and public policy realm. Um, so some roles that I've seen that kind of inspired me and I think are interesting options would be those who are able to get into a governmental position, um, getting into a position of influence after your medical training at some point where you can apply your technical knowledge to serve as an advisory position. A couple of names that come to mind uh, would be someone like Michael Osterholm, who is an American infectious disease epidemiologist, who's done extensive work on pandemic and public health preparedness and biosecurity. He was recently appointed to President Joe Biden's in the United States COVID Advisory Board. Another person who has a really interesting 80,000 hours podcast, which I'd recommend, is Tom Inglesby. He's also a U.S. doctor, and he's the director of the Johns Hopkins Security for Health Security. He's worked for the Centers of Disease Control in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and has also provided a tremendous amount of technical guidance on the response to COVID. Other things that come to mind would be advocacy and policy work. Um, uh, more of a historical tidbit is uh, the American Medical Association was one of the early lobbying efforts that really um, put forth efforts to get seatbelt mandates in the United States, um, thereby effectively saving a tremendous amount of lives by making it required to wear seatbelts. And there's another uh, 80,000 hours uh, advocacy piece, which highlights someone named Victor Sandoff, I might be saying that wrong. And he's described as one of the highest impact people of the 20th century. And he did a lot of lobbying efforts early on at, through the WHO. And he ended up bringing uh, forth eradication of smallpox by years and years. And then I think apart from that, people who can get into biomedical research, there seems to be a great desire for people with extensive medical knowledge and some form of statistical or programming skills. And that can be applied to genomics and infectious disease. And um, I'm sure um, some people in this panel could speak to that as well. Um, other things that might be slightly less within the realm of working in medicine, I think uh, it's people who have who are able to get a pretty profound social media or writing presence. Um, an author who most people would recognize would be Atul Gawande. Um, he's written a handful of books that are well read, including um, works relating to palliative care, um, which has, in a lot of ways, seemed to have initiated a lot of the palliative care movement in the United States. Um, and then otherwise, people who are able to apply their medical expertise and background to tech and innovation. And I'm sure Jassy, who's one of the panelists here, could speak to that more because she's worked in uh, Silicon Valley a little bit. Um, those are the things that come immediately to mind. And, yeah. yeah, that's a great overview. Thank you. And I would be interested in following up on a couple of those. Um, but even though we didn't coordinate it, you just brilliantly segued me into introducing our next speaker, which is Jassy Panu. So Jassy is a resident physician at Stanford University who researches biosecurity and global health policy. She's also an affiliate of the Stanford Existential Risks Initiative, and she's previously worked for Google AI, the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University and the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. Jassy, welcome, very pleased to have you with us. All right, thank you. Thanks for the very kind introduction. And I hope I managed that change of screens okay and that everyone can see me now. And do apologize if my internet connection is unstable at any point. Apologies in advance. Um, yeah, I guess I can just briefly touch on what Hunter just mentioned. I did have the privilege to work at Google early on when they were 
starting to work on a lot of their healthcare initiatives, which they're continuing to work on. And it was just really fun and exciting to see this huge tech company finally get interested in something that I really cared about, which was medical interventions. But I think that um, it's still really important for medics to be involved in this kind of work because even though we really rely on our colleagues who have you know, PhDs in machine learning and, and significant engineering expertise, you can't really do impactful work without having the knowledge of the how does the workflow work on the ground for making a medical diagnosis and what are the things you need to know. So there's definitely a role for medics to be involved there. Yeah, uh, I think that's something I'm going to um, pick up once I've introduced all our panelists is it seems like certainly so far what we've heard suggests you do need to have a certain grounding in in the kind of front line of healthcare in order to have some of these more impactful positions over time. Um, Jesse, apart from the fact that you've worked in a kind of um, you've ticked most of the effective altruism boxes because you've worked in AI, the existential risk, you're in a high impact career in its own right, but with a particular focus on, um, you know, biosecurity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, your background seems particularly relevant as we go past a year of, of the pandemic. So this is, this is probably an unfair question, but what do you think we've learned over the past year and how do you think it's going to affect your field going forward? Yeah. Well, thanks, Jack. I would say that's very generous to say that I have a substantial background in this because I really just started working in biosecurity a year before the COVID pandemic. So I, I certainly wasn't an expert, um, but had been working in this before, before it happened. And I think that really we've learned so much and will continue to learn so much. I think doctors, economists, public health researchers, all these different types of specialties will be looking at this natural experiment and the natural experiments that have occurred across countries in different states for years to come. So still lots to learn there. I think that um, for me, one thing that I recently have started to think about a lot more that I would like to learn more about is the importance of coordinating clinical trials, especially during a pandemic, because I think that during a pandemic, everyone is trying to generate meaningful knowledge about causal relationships as quickly as possible. And when we're trying to do that, at least during this pandemic, we saw that a lot of people thought, well, I need to generate knowledge right now. So I'm just gonna go off and run my own small clinical trial right now. And even though that's kind of the, the gut feeling that a lot of people had, it ended up being really not productive at all. You had a lot of small trials that were underpowered you had a lot of trials that were duplicating one another and wasting resources. And then you also had competition for patients being recruited to trials. So as a patient, you weren't even sure if you were joining the most beneficial trial for yourself. So I think that I'd like to think more about this and I'm curious to hear what everyone else thinks about how we could better coordinate clinical trials across the world so that even if an epidemic stops in one place, you can at least still have some comparable data coming from somewhere else. And we can really generate meaningful knowledge that will be helpful to physicians when they're treating their patients as quickly as possible. That's really interesting. And I had a conversation as part of the EA Global Reconnect with the Hewlett Foundation, who are specifically funding data collection efforts. They have a really interesting PDF. I'll see if I can get the link and drop it in the chat. But basically saying, we all aspire to do evidence-based policy but often the evidence is simply not available. You know, in some, this is in a kind of global health and poverty context, in some of the countries where they're trying to do evidence-based policy, they haven't even run a census in the last 20 years. So they don't even know how many people they're, you know, they're working with. And it's even hard to track whether death rates are going up or down and so on and so forth. So very, very, very relevant. Also, I promise that we didn't coordinate this, but you've brilliantly teed up our next panelist. So um, next panelist, whom I'm about to introduce, no pressure, but I need you to tee up the fourth one absolutely seamlessly, them's the rules. So I'm very, very excited to introduce Mats Olsen. Mats has 14 years of experience in clinical development for biotech and biopharma companies as part of a CRO and its investment affiliate. Matt's also founded the COVID Trial Dash to accelerate COVID vaccine trials, and he has been the Philly EA group organizer over the last three years. So the COVID Trial Dash 
Um, Max, I'm going to ask you to talk a bit about that, but it may have a role in what Jassy was just identifying. So Max, fantastic to have you with us. Um, my question to you is, what is the COVID trial dash and what led you to get involved? Sure. Thank you very much, Jack. And, and uh, first of all, let me say that, Jassy, we need to talk after this because there's a lot of things that we need to discuss. I'm collecting people that uh, that are interested in this area. So um, uh, but let me talk a little bit about COVID trial dash. Uh, I've been in the pharmaceutical clinical development industry for uh, a while now. And, uh, you know, from, from my perspective, you know, I wanted to bring something to the table that allowed us to kind of accelerate clinical trials. So uh, the way that I thought would be the best way to do that would be to kind of motivate people to just volunteer for the trials that, that we had. You know, there was a lot of good efforts on, on potentially adapting trials to human challenge trials or uh, adaptive designs. But, you know, at the same time, I, I also think that we need to meet people where they are. So, well, so basically COVID trial dash was a way for us to motivate people to enroll in studies. Uh, the, the theory being that, you know, the faster we enroll these studies, the faster they uh, are, are, the faster we have a database locked, the faster we can do statistical analysis, the faster we can put that in front of regulatory bodies, and the faster they'll be on the market and therefore saving lives. So um, in terms of accelerating, you know, uh, our, our goal was just basically to, to speed up the enrollment piece and, and focus in on that. Uh, we, had, we had a good amount of success, and, um, and now we're looking forward to, you know, how do we pivot this to, uh, to other indications or other therapeutic areas? Uh, and we're also looking at, you know, as, as Jasper was pointing out, you know, in, in the next situation, how do we go about doing that? The, the industry, luckily, due to COVID, kind of pivoted a lot to uh, what's something called decentralized trials, right, which, which is basically not requiring patients to go to the sites anymore. Uh, and that's been a great, um, uh, a great movement just overall for the industry, but also I think it's good, it opens up some good options uh, for uh, collecting data in a more efficient and effective way. So um, so it's, a, it's an area of, of interest for me, continuing, but uh you know, so far, COVID trial dash has been a great experience uh, to, to date. Excellent. And it is interesting Thanks. how I think um, for people who are outside the sector like me, we think, OK, there's a big public health problem and that's going to be a medical response. But actually, we're increasingly seeing the importance of tech and coordination. And actually, mm -hmm. I suppose we're seeing this right now because there's some controversy around the AstraZeneca results. And so then you're into a messaging and public trust issue. And it has been very interesting to me to see how it needs to be an all court press. I mean, they've talked in the States about how they need to treat it, you know, like they're on a war footing because they need to coordinate everything from industry that can be repurposed to do the production of materials that are needed through, you know, supply chain management, public messaging, mm -hmm. um, the coordinating trials, it's just, everything in this full court press so i do think that's been really highlighted in the last in the last 12 months absolutely i think i think it's kind of underlined the fact that we need to have plans in place we need to have you know these things thought out before you know we're, we're in a situation where a pandemic requires us to to start moving fast um, and, you know, I think EA can bring something to the table because EA is very focused on basically the bottom line uh, in terms of our ability to, to kind of have a social impact, you know, whether it be uh, getting vaccines to developing countries, uh, where, whereas they, they wouldn't be due to the, the CEPI's initiatives with COVAX um, or uh, potentially even other areas uh, in, the, in the medical field uh, and kind of developing world as well. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's an area that I think is a, a, a kind of fertile field for us to kind of explore as, as EAers that have kind of a bio or medical uh, uh, predilection. Yeah, fantastic. It, uh, I, I assume I can interpret that as you saying it's a good idea not to have to build the plane and fly it at the same time, which is basically what we're doing at the moment. Pretty much. Indeed. Um, well, guys, just to remind you, please keep your questions coming in through the Q&A so that we can start answering some of your questions as well as some of mine. But before we turn to that, I'm going to introduce our last panellist. Lucia is a medical doctor with both clinical and research experience. She's previously worked as a doctor in London and contributed to a number of effective altruist projects. She recently co-founded a new potentially high impact charity through the charity entrepreneurship program called the Lead Exposure Elimination Project, which I'm particularly excited about as a funder in global health. Lucia, um, welcome, great to have you with us. And could you tell us a bit about LEAP and also what led you to focus on this rather than a more traditional medical career? Yeah, so um, LEAP or Lead Exposure Elimination Project is a new health policy NGO and we focus on advocating for regulation of lead paint in countries where there's a large and growing burden of lead poisoning from paint. 
which is actually a surprisingly big problem. One in three children worldwide have lead poisoning and it has really severe impacts on health and neurodevelopment and future income and a lot of different flow through effects. Um, yeah, and, and the main reason I decided to go through the charity entrepreneurship incubation program and co-found LEAP was because I just thought the potential for impact was, was really good. I really enjoy clinical medicine and I absolutely love working in the hospital, but I did feel like I wasn't having a particularly significant positive impact just by working as part of a huge system that would probably function just as well without me. Um, and I thought that by starting a health policy NGO focused on a big and neglected problem, I could have a larger scale impact that wouldn't necessarily otherwise be had. Um, and I think the transition has been, been quite good. Um, I think medicine prepares, prepares you quite well for running a charity startup. There are quite a lot of cross applicable skills. So for example, you have the scientific background, um, which helps you to be analytical and cost effectiveness focused. And it also gives you a lot of communication and decision-making skills, which are really useful in all sorts of charity startups. Um, and it also teaches you to learn fast and cope in stressful situations. So I think, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a pretty smooth transition from uh, working in clinical medicine full-time to starting this health policy charity. I'm really pleased to hear that, but I'm also really surprised. You may be the only person I know in a small startup who describes that transition as smooth, uh, but I'm really pleased that that happened for you because I remember it being complete chaos. Um, so this links in to a question that I'd like to throw open to anyone on the panel who's interested in answering. Um, and maybe Lucy, you could kick us off. We often hear that doctors feel like they're having a high impact just through being doctors. So can you speak to your views on that? And also particularly in, in your case, why you, you felt that you could have a higher impact in a non-medical doctor role? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that reminds me of a time when um, I was having, having lunch in the doctor's mess and someone had just, someone who was on call had just come back from their bleep and was like, oh, I just treat someone for sepsis. I've just saved a life. I'm gonna add that to my list of lives saved. And I was like, oh, okay. So like, how do you work out who goes on your list of lives saved? Like how many lives have you actually saved? Um, and the way they were seeing it was like, every time they uh, were involved in life-saving intervention, that was, a, that was a life saved. But then I was like, okay, but what if, what if you hadn't answered your bleep today? He was like, oh yeah, good point. Actually, probably that patient wouldn't have died if I hadn't answered my bleep. Like there are other doctors in the hospital who probably would have given them antibiotics and, and treat them for sepsis and saved their life. And I think, that's like that's the thing with medicine is that we feel it's very easy to feel like we're having uh, a big impact because we're right there with the patients involved in doing life-saving and life-improving treatments and that kind of thing um but actually there have there has been some research into what the how many lives we're actually saving over our career and it's sometimes i think surprisingly less than we think because um there are these like it's it's more about the marginal impact that we're having like wh what's what is, what difference does one additional doctor make in a health system in a high income country um and uh, dr gregory lewis did some research into this um and i think he basically calculated uh how how many uh, quality adjusted life years um how, or how many disability just adjusted life years are averted each year when someone works in uh clinical medicine and I think it's around four to 12 or three to 12 a year, um, which is equivalent to like four, four to 20 lives saved over the course of a 40 year medical career, which seems pretty surprising um, because I think we feel like we're doing a lot more than that when, when we're practicing clinically. But I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that what really impacts how healthy people are a lot of the time is main, mainly the social determinants of health. It's things like sanitation and education, nutrition, um, wealth and those types of things. Um, and then there's also the fact that health resources are already concentrated in areas where uh, there's less need. So, for example, in the UK, the NHS will fund an intervention that will bring about uh, one quality adjusted life year or one year of healthy life for around £25,000. Whereas in another country, we could fund that, uh, we could fund something that will bring about the same benefit for around £25. So that comes to kind of this, this idea that we can probably have more of an impact a lot of the time by donating our money to higher impact interventions um, in countries where there are uh, less resources than we can do our actual clinical practice, which is, yeah, kind of interesting. 
So yeah, don't know what other people think about that one. Yeah, I could jump in. I think that was really well said and really well worded as well. In my experience, interestingly, I feel like I've, been, I've experienced two camps of people, um, two camps of physicians at some point in their medical career become disillusioned to that idea that they are making a difference or that they are saving that life in the in the way that you described that one encounter you had. And when they become disillusioned by that, it becomes a pretty hard source of internal turmoil where they were practicing medicine for so many years. And after years and years of actually getting there, they're learning that they're starting to feel like what they're doing isn't having that impact that they have. And then the alternative is the camp of people who just kind of get more and more ground in that illusion and start to just convince themselves like, yeah, this is it, I'm doing it and get more in, in, grounded in that, that way of thinking. Um, and I think in general, my view on this it is it's one of, the, one of those times where it's useful to reflect that often as human beings psychologically, our feelings are not always aligned with objective reality and how things are. Um, some in our brain can play psychological tricks to make us feel better and get through the day and um, try to do what's best. And for that reason, I think, you know, it's often worth just reflecting on um, one's goals, one's um, outcomes that they want to achieve, achieve, trying to be objective and getting a multitude of perspectives when making these types of decisions. Um, whether it's going into medicine or leaving medicine or how the a career in medicine is going to align with uh, one's goals. Um, and I think that can really help people not have to fall into one of those camps of feeling um, hard-lined, illusioned into that, that belief system or just getting burnt out. just talked on mute it was inevitably going to happen i'm pleased it was me guys don't worry i took that bullet for you there's a question that relates to this it's just come into the q a that i'd like to drop in it's from siraj who says how do the following ideas interplay one is that one additional doctor will not have that much of an impact and another is the idea that there's a need for more doctors um, so could someone speak to that I, well, I was actually going to say that I think Lucia already said it beautifully, which is really it's about the marginal impact. And when you live in a in a wealthy country that already has such good standards of living, as well as sanitation and and the other social determinants of health that she was mentioning, then the marginal impact of a of an additional physician in one of those countries can be seen as much lower than if you were in a country that did not have those resources and also had far fewer doctors. So I think that uh, just like what Hunter was mentioning that sometimes physicians who feel this way and are starting to get burnt out, they try to, or I wouldn't say that this is common, but one approach people take is they think about going to practice medicine in a different location and uh, practicing somewhere where their medical um, services are more in need or would have more marginal impact. And I think that sometimes that can be really helpful, not only for the the provider, but also for the patients, but sometimes it can be harmful. And I think there's lots of stories of physicians who try and go to a different location and just impart their medical skills and then leave again, leaving those communities without any resources. So I think that it's really challenging to do that well. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jesse. And just picking up on that, another question from the Q&A that relates to this, this is from Sanjus who says, do you feel that public health and policy making roles are high impact even when we take replaceability into account? Uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit from, from, a, from a regulatory or clinical development side a little bit. Um, you know, public policy has been one of the, the, the main things that's, that's been keeping vaccine developments kind of in arrears uh, for, for COVID, for example. So, you know, more people in government positions, more people in uh, policymaking positions, more people in positions of power that can really impact, you know, people's ability to um, take shortcuts when, when we need to, uh, in, especially in the, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, I think is, is 
probably a, a much larger impact than any individual doctor might have. Uh, I would also say public policy, public health, I don't know as much, but I would also kind of put that high up there with you know, biomedical research and kind of, you know, this government kind of positions that that kind of delve into the bio risk and, and uh, kind of preparedness and, and uh, prevention space for bio risk as well. I would second that. I would also add that um, in regarding replaceability, even if there are people, if there's a position set up and someone's going to serve in it, whether it's a policy role, if you're coming into it with a, uh, an effective background, an effective altruism type mindset, I think that is less likely to be replaced and you could steer policy decisions and steer the ship in more effective ways than someone else who might, who doesn't have that background, but would be serving that position. Yeah, and I think there are also quite a lot of neglected areas in, in health policy and, for example, in the type of health policy advocacy that we do, um, advocating for lead paint regulation. There are countries where there's where we're working where there's no other uh, organizations working on that type of health policy or advocacy. So I think the, the neglectedness can also mean that the replaceability is less of a problem. Absolutely. And I think we've been kind of dancing around a fundamental question here, which Kaleem has posed in the Q&A. So I'd like to turn to that now. For college students who are pre-med, but still have time to decide what they want to do, would you still encourage them to go into medicine versus other high impact fields? I kind of hope I know the answer to this, but I'm going to throw it open and let you guys handle that question. Okay, I can go. We're all just looking at each other. I know we are. <laughs> um, I would say, in general, for a simple answer, my answer would probably be no. But I think that it's highly person dependent, value system dependent, and situation dependent. So I don't think I would say no one should ever go into medicine if they're considering it. I would say, again, it would be really worth it to reflect on what your goals are what outcomes you're hoping to achieve, um, getting a lot of feedback from different minded people and, and then making that decision, taking into account your individual setup. Um, and with that said, obviously this panel has medics who are trying to be effective and hopefully will be, and we all went into medicine. So it's not like it's a, a dead end necessarily, but it's definitely worth reflecting on what what your goals are and what you're what you're trying to get out of it. Yeah, I think I definitely agree with Hunter there. And I think I think it's like 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 you said, it's like very person dependent. Um, and I think that there are a huge number of super impactful things that someone with a background in medicine um, can do. But I think one of the risks is that that I've noticed for me is that once you start down a medical path and you go to medical school and you start medical training, it's such a kind of smooth and easy route um, to just practicing medicine for the rest of your life. And I think the risk of value drift is actually really quite high. Like you might, you might start thinking, okay, I'm going to go into medicine and I'm going to prioritize impact and I want to do something cost effective. Um, but once you get into the world of uh, kind of clinical medicine and everyone around you is doing the regular kind of medical route, it can be quite hard to um, kind of keep those values of impact and cost effectiveness at the front of your mind and, and make uh, the decisions according to them once, once you start. So I think that's something to bear in mind if you do want to take the medical route um, as a path to impact. And not, not to pick pile, but, but I agree with both, 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 both of you said, but I'll just add that, you know, a lot of the kind of ideal career paths in kind of the medical biomedical space um, you know, they might be better suited by other degrees and other kind of uh, backgrounds, you know, so if we're looking at bio risk, if we're looking at public policy, if we're looking at, um, you know, e even, even just biomedical research, there are other degrees that might be a little bit more fine tuned to kind of what those ultimate jobs would be. Um, but having said that, I think, you know, also a medical degree is, is, is very valuable no matter what. So um, it also gives you kind of the confidence to go and do something riskier because, you know, you can always fall back on it. Uh, so I'll, I'll, you know, and, and I'm not a doctor myself, so I'll, I'll speak from an from a external perspective. I assume that that's the case. But, but I also agree that I think the value drift issue is, is, is high. I see the same thing with lawyers. I see the same thing with other people that have kind of a, a trolley, kind of on the trolley track of a particular career path. So I very much agree with that. 
If I can just jump in in defense of uh, going straight into medicine as an impactful career, which feels weird because I'm the only person who didn't, uh, or maybe me and Matt's together. Um, this is just a general point I have about thinking about your career, which is much of the effect of altruism community focuses very hard on what to do immediately post-graduation in order to be impactful. But it always seems to me that many of the people who, if you were just making a list of incredibly impactful people, many of the people who would be on it did not follow a linear path to where they are now. And so I know if Eddie Hassenfeld, who some of you may know who founded GiveWell was on this call, he would tell you the most important thing to do in the first 10 years of your career is to get really good at being a, an employee in a job because we need people who are really good at a wide variety of jobs. And even if you're super bright, you're probably not going to be great at your first job for the first couple of years. And you will learn loads of things about how to negotiate, manage your time, manage up, manage down, uh, position thing, you know, influence priorities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I would just speak in defense of, don't get too hung up on what the first step you take is. I know that going down the route of being a medical doctor commits you for quite a while, albeit that we have people on the panel who've done that for a bit and have now transitioned into something that's related but different. But I would say to you that um, the grounding that you will get in almost any career may be very, very useful in the future. And one thing that I always come back to is that arguably the most impactful humans of all time have been involved in medical breakthroughs. So commonly cited is the eradication of smallpox, which has arguably counterfactually saved more lives than any other action in, in, in human history. And the people who ended up doing that didn't know they were going to do that when they were 23. So um, I thought everything the panel said was was well reasoned. Um, I think it's great to think seriously about where to have an impact, but I am also someone who's in favour of doing something that's good and working out how to make it amazing at a later date. So that's my two cents. Another related question to pick up with this. Uh, Brenda asks, if I'm an aspiring doctor who's currently an undergraduate student, how can I keep being involved in effective altruism? And Hunter, I'm going to throw that to you in the first instance. So there, it was a pre-medical student and how to be involved in the effect of altruism, right? Yes. Um, I would say just keep learning, just keep reading, getting involved in opportunities that you can. Um, try to see if there's a local EA group and if there's not, start one. Um, after you've like developed the appropriate amount of knowledge and, and skills to be co comfortable doing that and confident doing it in an in a effective way. Um, there's obviously a large global community and a, and a tremendous amount of resources online um, for you to lean on. So I would say just keep entrenching yourself in, in this community and, and keeping that mindset as you get more near the different career pivot decision points. And, and then I think um, it'll slowly come to fruition and your career will kind of be be taken down whatever path seems to be most effective. And related to this, another question that came in was um, how to avoid value drift. Lucy, you mentioned this in your previous answers. So what would your advice be to someone uh, in, any, in any career, but particularly in medicine, to make sure that they stay focused on, on the plan? Yeah, I think um, for me, what works quite well is just uh, kind of analyzing my values and working out what they what they really are and clarifying them to myself and, and reminding myself when I start to feel less mo motivated or distracted um, and also being part of a community of people with similar values is super helpful because it helps you think about what they are it helps you uh, be motivated to, to stick to them um, and it also is just inspiring to be around other people with really cool values um, so yeah, that would, those would be my, my main things for how I try and avoid value drift. Does anyone on the panel have a long-term plan that they'd be willing to share with us that they're currently pursuing? Uh, 
could go really quickly. Um, Long-term plan is subject to change every 30 minutes, it seems like, but I would say, interestingly, my long-term plan is to continue to be in medicine and continue to be an ER doctor. Um, but I think after I finish my specialization and eventually if I get into more disaster work, that that amount will be um, lessened, hopefully maybe like 20 or 30%. So I could still be doing clinical medicine because I do enjoy it. And the rest of it will be hopefully in a governmental, either state or regional or federal level, um, providing guidance, recommendations for public health preparedness and pandemic response and stuff like that. Excellent. Um, Jassy, can I, can I pressure you over that question? I'm super interested in what the plan is uh, with your background so far. Yeah, I, that's, um, that's a tricky one. I don't, I'm not sure if you know, but I'm just in my first year of training. So I've almost, you know, I, I've definitely pre-committed myself to at least another three years before I'm a fully licensed doctor. So at least that's my short-term definite plan. And um, I think ideally in the long term, I would like to, very similar to what Hunter was mentioning, continue to practice uh, for a portion of my career and then also additionally continue doing biosecurity research and policy research. Uh, and then I'm hoping to also tie in some, some technical um, expertise in uh, biomedical stuff into all of that. I think for the large part, I've left behind the medical AI field that's kind of behind me, um, but it's certainly very interesting. I think that there, it, it, there's so much, there's so much within EA, or sorry, I should say effective altruism and medicine that is interesting. And it's important to find a niche first and develop that fully. So I'd like to do that at least with biosecurity and infectious disease is what I'm planning to specialize in. Well, that's great. Thanks for sharing. I've only just noticed as well that you're actually wearing a pair of lab goggles. So there yeah. you go, guys. It's not, you can't, don't get any more authentic than this. She was yeah, putting I'm stuff I'm on call in. today. So I just have, uh, you know, a few, 15 more minutes or so. And then I go back to admitting you guys know what it's like. <laughs> Fantastic. I'd like to talk briefly, partly because it's very relevant to my job and um, partly because I think it's a question we hear a lot from students about uh, where does donating fit in having a high impact as a doctor? And I notice uh, Luke from Giving What We Can, who's helping us today, has put in the chat that preventing value drift is a big part of why people take the Giving What We Can pledge, likewise the One for the World pledge. So could some of you speak to the value of donating and also why it's important if you are in a medical career to make sure that you are donating as well, in my humble opinion. So I, I can I can talk a little bit about, I think the value of it, you know, uh, as, as part of like a group leader of, of a city, you know, we uh, often get asked, you know, why should I donate? Who should I donate to? And, and, and these questions allow us to kind of delve into a lot of the principles that effective altruism um, has good answers for. So, um, you know, I think donating first and foremost uh, allows you to delve into the, the kind of the philosophical underpinnings, the kind of um, the theories around how to think about these problems, which allows you to then uh, be able to bring those into your career or into your job or into any projects that you do on, on the side or, uh, you know, like, like Lucia, start getting a startup eventually, you know, the, these things allow you to kind of start building up that expertise. Um, and, and I'll add that, you know, it, it, obviously uh, there's the direct benefit of doing that and, and the fact that you'll start building kind of an identity around giving an identity around effective altruism you know putting skin in the game always gets people involved no matter what um so once you've once you've done that for a couple of years take the pledge you know you will you will now see yourself as somebody that's going to do that for the rest of your life and you'll see yourself as an effective altruist so um so from my perspective i think that's very important it also it, there's also signaling that you can signal to other people it's it creates pressure for other people to maybe think about how much they're donating. So I, I also motivate people not to be shy about talking about it either. So once you start donating, feel free to talk to, talk to people about it. It can be a little awkward, but I think, you know, after you get it over that first hump, uh, there's a lot of good that can come out of it. So, um, yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. I'd also just highlight something that Shelley um, mentioned in a question of hers, which is, you have the potential by donating to free up 
time for somebody else and you may be very time poor at many parts of your medical career but just by donating a small amount you can have this huge multiplier effect by funding somebody else to work on a really high impact problem i've always felt that donating is a is just a big impact multiplier because we know particularly certainly in, in, in my area which is in global health we know that the same amount of money goes profoundly different distances in different places and so just by giving you know in our case we only ask for a minimum of one percent of your salary you can actually end up funding way more than one percent of the salary of someone who's working in a developing country so i would really emphasize that opportunity as well um i'm going to pivot slightly um to a question that came in from someone uh, who's asked to remain anonymous. Um, but the question is, what are some potentially exciting interventions to scale up the provision of medicine to people who currently do not have access to it? And they didn't specify whether they're talking about developed or developing countries or both, but I would throw that out to the panel uh, for your thoughts. I think that my answer might be might be similar to what others say, but it also kind of um, skirts the question, perhaps. But I really think that the way you bring medicine to at least developing countries is by sustainable economic growth. So it's not really even medical interventions, but it's just providing the economic growth to those countries such that they can reach the level of wealth of other countries. And, and, and of course, I think increasing medical education in those countries is helpful, but I think that there is a order of operations there where it's less helpful to go in with the high tech medical equipment if you haven't even had these sustainable economic growth yet. So I think there's a starting point and then you add on medical education and then providing these other more direct medical interventions. Super. Um, Lucia, I wonder if you could briefly talk about uh, if this is uh, something that you've covered at LEAP, um, any ideas you've heard about to try and increase access to medical services within developing countries? Yeah, I think I think I agree with what Jassy said about uh, sustainable economic development being pretty key to allow countries to provide um, access to healthcare to their populations. Um, I suppose like LEAP has quite a specific uh, kind of health impact, but actually one of the, the most significant impact of reducing lead poisoning is increasing uh, income and that in turn increases a country's GDP. And so a lot of the benefit comes from increasing um, economic development, um, which has that flow through effect on improving hopefully healthcare systems and healthcare provision. Um, and I would also uh, second the, the, the thing about um, uh, providing specific uh, health uh, facilities or interventions when they're not um, necessarily part of a developing healthcare system. Um, it can be done well, like for example, uh, providing malaria nets to reduce the incidence of malaria, but it can also be done not that well. I was once working in a hospital in Sierra Leone where there had been a, a dialysis machine donated, really expensive piece of equipment, uh, which was just never used because they didn't even have the disposable cannulas and equipment necessary to hook it up to people. So I think, yeah, so I think that uh, there are there are good and good and bad ways to do it. And I think effect, the effective altruist approach of really kind of analyzing the impact of, of these different um, interventions to improve access to health is, is the way, way to go about it. Yeah. On mute again. Thank you for that. I agree with that. I'd also just as a specific uh, charity, I would highlight Living Goods, which is a Givewell standout charity, which specifically works in health access and has done some very, very good work over the last few years. So if you're interested uh, specifically in health access in developing countries, I would recommend that you have a look at them. Really interesting question from Shay that I'd like to throw open to the panel. Can you discuss the role of mental health in global health measures? What would we be, sorry, would be interested in your thoughts on its relative importance and whether that varies by location, as well as how it factors into life satisfaction and subjective well-being?
Um, I might, should I answer that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's hugely important part of health and one of the most neglected parts of global health. Uh, and um, I think there's this myth that mental health problems are a kind of first world problem, um, that they're more prevalent in higher income countries, which is actually uh, not, not borne out by evidence at all. In fact, um, the prevalence of anxiety and depression is greater in uh, low, low income contexts and uh, where people are suffering with poverty and uh, other effects due to uh, yeah, poverty and that kind of thing. Um, and I think that there are some really cool uh, new, newer uh, global health interventions uh, addressing uh, mental health. So Strong Minds is one of them and uh, Friendship Bench is another. They both provide uh, CBT and IPT uh, in group contexts, um, which is really effective at uh, improving uh mental health well-being life satisfaction measures as well um yeah i don't know if that properly answers the question but yeah i think i think mental health is not always considered part of health or global health but it definitely should be and in, in is being more so now great thanks lucia any any thoughts from the rest of the panel on mental health um and its importance in in health measures going forward, uh, I'll, I'll just add I'm not an expert in this area, but but from from what I understand, it's you know mental health is even neglected, even even if you account for the standards of poverty and, and physical health. So you know even if you take that in consideration, it's still neglected compared to all these other ones. So it's not like it's not like there's a priority list and it's like further down the list. It might even be equal or higher in, in some cases, depending on the intervention, depending on where it's compared to. And I think also in terms of tractability. Um, you know, a lot of people have doubts about tractability, given kind of the, the, the you know, kind of the, the interventions that we usually do in the Western world, can they fit into other, other uh, situations? And I think, you know, some of the charities that, that Lucia was bringing up, I think have been, uh, made great strides to show that I think there are, it is tractable, it, and there's a lot you can do there. Um, and I think it's an area of, of, of growth for, for, for effective altruism overall. So I'm excited for the question. I'm excited for, for that, that movement as well. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Um, guys, we're into the last five minutes here. A few things, kind of housekeeping things. The first thing is we are really interested in your feedback once the event is finished. We are really interested in you opting in to hear from the different partners um, related to the event. And you'll get some, an email about that. But also, I think Luke is going to launch a poll for you to do that. We're also going to be hanging around for another half hour after the event. So if anyone has questions that haven't been answered that I don't manage to get to in the last five minutes, then do please stick around. Um, but when you're answering the poll that's in front of you, please do scroll down to the bottom and you can see the different aspects of follow-up that you can opt into. We won't be contacting you unless you do opt into those. So please indicate anybody that you would like to hear from about next steps. And while you're doing that, really good question from Robert. I'm really interested in people's thoughts on this. How would you change the medical student curriculum to help students and future physicians be better aligned with effective altruism's primary goals? And I think maybe uh, if we have an answer for the US and then an answer for the UK, that would be great. Hunter and Chassie just look at each other, waiting for one of them to answer. Come on, guys, one of you. I'm just thinking because it's it's such a good question, but I I feel like a textbook would be required to <laughs> answer it properly. I think that uh, having just like Jesse or maybe not finished med school pretty recently, I think there are a lot of areas for improvement. To, to put it mildly, um, there are. A tremendous amount of disparities in general with what's taught, what's not taught, um, and how you're trained and how, how what, what type of person that melds. So I, I think that a lot would need to change to, or needs to change in general, just to make it a more effective way to educate people to have an impact. Um, um, I think part of that would be just awareness of of the idea of having an effective based curriculum 
um, and having a system where uh, there are means of measuring outcomes as far as is this an effective curriculum? Is it effective to teach people in this manner with specific goals in mind? Um, and having a more coordinated effort. Uh, I guess that would be my short answer, but I think that I don't have a great answer, but it would require a lot of thought and a pretty detailed response to adequately answer it. Jesse, any thoughts from your current experience? Yeah, I think I think I agree with what Hunter says, and I also feel as though this is a deeper conflict in medicine where it's, you know, in your medical training and what every patient wants from their physician is for their physician to put their needs first. And really you're focused on the one patient in front of you when you're practicing medicine. And that mindset, that whole way of thinking is very different from a public health point of view, which prioritizes how can you have the most impact for a population. And a lot of effective altruism draws its values and has similar values from the public health mindset, but it's very difficult and I would say almost impossible to wear your public health hat when you are practicing clinical medicine. And that's just a really um, challenging thing to balance. And I think that's why it's been so difficult to incorporate a lot of this in medical education, because the former mindset of focusing on the one patient in front of you is really the uh, prevailing view. Great, Lucia, any thoughts from a UK perspective? Yeah, I think it's quite similar. And I, I agree with what Hunter and, and Jassy both said, especially about there being this conflict with the two different ways of thinking about things like uh, doing everything for the patient in front of you versus thinking about like the, the population level and effectiveness. Um, I think probably it would be it would be great if there was just a bit more of awareness uh, taught in medical schools about what impact we're really having. Um, while we do this direct patient care um, so that people can think a bit more, um, challenge themselves a little bit more about uh, how much good they're doing and whether it's re they really are uh, working according to what their values um, or whether there are certain paths they can take within their career um, that might increase their impact. So things like thinking about how much, how much good, does it, good does it do to that marginal impact of an additional doctor um, and yeah those sorts of things. Perfect, thank you. Uh, a question from Sanjush that I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts on. They write, as a medical student who's hoping to make an impact through either one, general health policy work or research, sorry, or research in two, biosecurity, three, global health, or four, aging, how important do you think it is from an impact perspective to specialize in one of these fields early in their career compared to trying to do work in all four? So to remind you, that's either general health policy work or research in biosecurity, global health or aging. And would you as a panel recommend specializing early or trying to pursue all four of those? I'll, um, I'll give my two, my two cents, but I'm also curious to see what other people say. Um, I think overall, there's always kind of a mix of, of kind of keeping an open mind at the, at the beginning of the career with them going towards a specialization. Uh, it, it's hard a decision to make. Uh, I typically see a lot of successful people uh, on the specialization side, uh, but I, I've also seen people that generalize and become great kind of jack of all trades. But, you know, the specialization allows you, particularly in these areas and particularly in the medical and biomedical field, I think it's, it's kind of a requirement in a lot of cases. So specialization, I think I would err on that side uh, to, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and I'm also just curious, you know, uh, I'd be curious to what, what the other panelists think about prioritization between those areas and kind of which ones people think that they should perhaps even consider more strongly or not. And, and from my perspective, I think this really depends on some kind of key considerations and, and key, key thoughts that you have about, you know, whether, whether existential risk is, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you believe the tenets and the, the logic behind believing in, in, in long-termism and uh, preventing existential risk, or whether you believe something more direct, uh, in which case, you know, in, or short-term is uh, in, the, in which case you're looking at health policy, uh, you're looking at global health. Um, 
Uh, so, so uh, you know, it kind of depends on some of those key considerations and kind of which which way you end up on those. Um, but I think all four are, are very interesting areas that, you know, biosecurity and clinical research are, are kind of my areas of, of expertise, but I'm also extremely interested in aging. I think we're going to have um, a lot of developments in aging in the next 10, 20 years. Uh, and I'm also really interested in the uh, uh, in the global health space as well, but uh, but I'll leave, I'll leave the other panelists to talk more about anything else. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult to give direct advice not knowing exactly where this person is in their career, but I I am wondering if they're very early on in their career. I generally suggest to people to kind of take a more opportunistic approach. And that's not necessarily to say that you're disingenuous in any way. It sounds like they're interested in all of these different areas. But when you're so early in your career, if a really great opportunity comes your way, it's probably the most high yield thing to jump on that when it presents itself to you and then see where it takes you rather than committing yourself very early on to saying you're, you're a specialist in this one area. Um, but I do also agree with Matt that it's always helpful to kind of focus on one area first to develop some kind of background and expertise because it's really hard to master four different areas all at once. And usually um, it's it's more, it's just you develop a, a depth of knowledge that is more useful if you kind of think about one area rather than all four. And I think Jesse kind of summarized my view perfectly, um, which I was struggling to do when I was thinking about an answer. And I, I think that my approach in general has been to have a clear cut direction that I'm heading. And then as opportunities come about, um, and as I learned things that I just wasn't aware of before, um, taking advantage of them and kind of allowing that general direction trend to pivot slightly and adjust and then reflect and update my 10 year plan, which is why I was saying I seem to update it every 30 minutes. Um, so that's just the general approach that I would take. I would, I would add, I would agree with that. And I'd also add that I found it quite helpful to just like test out very small projects in different fields. So for example, like in med school did a infectious disease research project, found out I really don't like working in a lab at all. Um, and then got involved volunteering in some a different type of research and found out I really like that. And then uh, now I'm trying out this kind of policy advocacy work and realizing I'm quite a good fit. So I think if you can, if you can test out without too much time investment, these different areas a little bit and find out a bit about your own fit as well, then that can be really valuable. Great, thank you guys. And really nice to finish the official part. Um, we're all gonna hang around for a bit, but to finish the official part, the contribution from all four of you. I'd like to say congratulations in that you held absolutely every attendee for over an hour, which is the only webinar I've ever been on where that has happened. So congratulations, you're super engaging and much more engaging than average. Jassy, I know you in particular, I think, have to dial off. So thank you so much for coming. Really, really appreciate your time. For people who are still on, please make sure you do fill out the poll. Apparently, we're at about 70% completion, but we can't follow up with you. And even if you don't want to hear from us ever again, please give us your feedback in terms of how you rated the session. That is the end of the official part of today's webinar. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists and everybody who submitted questions and came along. Hi, I'm Hunter Lau from Effective Altruism Medicine. This group was created to spread EA ideas in healthcare, to provide networking opportunities, and to further the discussion on the role that medicine has in the EA movement. We're a relatively new group and would love to have you along for the ride. Hi, I'm Jack at One for the World. We ask people to pledge 1% of their income to the most cost-effective charities working in global health and poverty. So if you'd like to give just a small amount of your income to help some of the world's most disadvantaged people, please get in touch. We're also really keen to speak at universities and at workplaces about effective giving. So if your classmates or colleagues would like to join the fight against extreme poverty, please let me know. I'm Tanya Quijano, one of the co-organizers of Effective Altruism Philippines. Effective altruism groups are communities of people who learn together and support each other to effectively improve the lives of others. 
there are over 200 groups based in cities, countries, and universities all over the world, and there are even online groups that anyone can join wherever they live. Find your closest group on the EA Hub and reach out to the Center for Effective Altruism Groups team if you want to learn more. Hi, my name is Catherine McCrory Flynn and I am the founder and director of Wambam. Uh, Wambam is a mentorship um, and professional network uh, that is designed for women, non-binary people and trans people of all genders. If you are interested and excited by effective altruism and looking to pursue a high impact career in this field, please reach out to me. Thank you. Giving what we can are a community of effective givers. We aim to create a culture where people are inspired to give more and to give more effectively. Check out givingwhatwecan.org to find our effective giving recommendations, donate to a high impact charity, or to join our growing community of people who've pledged to give a meaningful portion of their income to help improve the lives of others. Catherine from the Centre for Effective Altruism. The Effective Altruism community is a group of people from all over the world that aim to use evidence and reason to work out how to benefit others as much as possible. The Centre for Effective Altruism supports this community. We run conferences, support local groups and run the EA Forum, which is an online discussion space. We also support community members through our community health team. Please reach out if you'd like to know more.